three, two, one. <laughs> Hello? Checking in. Anybody out there? Hello? <laughs> All right, we have some <laughs> questions going. So this is uh, kind of uh, different times for me, even though I'm in the house all the time, like I said before, creating art. This quarantine and this stay at home, we have to take kind of seriously in order to help um, the people that are going through the hard times. And uh, since we are home and we are all in, we have that in common, which is the, that wanting to create. And uh, why not um, reflect on some of the aspects of our lives, how things are changing and time to, you know, kind of go introspective and, and think and reorder. Maybe you have uh, things that you have bad, um, a bad system that sometimes is not helping and you want to get rid of get rid of habits that might be affecting you guys and this is a time to recheck that maybe get into new more healthy habits for your art and i'm glad to see you all joining us and feel free to make some new friends we have a, a lot of different countries here hanging out as one community that's all good so i'm taking these days to chat with you because i know there is a psychological crisis as well and and it's better if we stay clear if we stay calm and um anyways if you share we share some ideas as artists okay so let's uh stay supporting ourselves each other Let's see if we want to, I want to go straight to questions. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention though before is that we got to take this time to realize how creativity, a lot of people have, uh, you know, kind of brought out a lot of creativity and with this new funny memes or new videos about the, the problems and, and uh, in the house doing certain things. And that's kind of refreshing to see that sometimes we get caught up in life with the problems of the outside world and we get distracted. And once we are alone, we have a lot of things to think about. And sometimes we see strength in ourselves that we never saw before or now we have time to do what we love and with the conditions that we have and that's important and that's also letting us know that when we are in social media to not go for the bait of the like to not put out their content that you pretty much think that people will like it don't worry about that this is proof what's happening in our time is proof that you should go uh, authentic you should uh, reflect what you really think about because even though it hasn't been accepted yet and you might think what if other people don't like the way I see the world or the way I draw or the way I do stuff maybe um, you, you realize that by offering that part of you and by posting it out there you will get attention in time Everything new at first looks strange and we don't know what to respond. But as artists, we have to offer something unique. We cannot go for the easy post, pretty post that shows the like. I think we should go creative and sh we should risk the like in for exchange of a, of a unique point of view that I'm sure you all have to express. Okay, someone is asking, uh, greetings, I discovered my passion for painting later in life. I was 48. It is four years later. Is it too late for me? Well, I think you are fortunate to, to be able to realize that you had that calling of, of uh, creating and that passion for creating art that maybe was kind of trapped or distracted. I do not believe that there is a time period that you have to do stuff. Of course, if you're, you know, a gymnastic, you know, into gymnastics or something like that, that requires more, more of a training. But I think art, what I suggest is that instead of, since you realize that you're starting um, art later than most people or later in your own life, I believe because I mean, and it's only an opinion because my whole life I've been doing this, okay? So for me, it's not out of experience. I cannot say, oh, I used to be a truck driver and suddenly I found my passion and I was, you know, I couldn't draw before and now I'm drawing and I make, make a living as an artist. So of course my, 
my opinion is limited. But from my understanding, I believe that that's good because maybe you created a career, maybe you have a foundation already in life. So now your art could be more honest even because you probably won't have to struggle to make the sale fast. What I recommend if you're starting late, you have the advantage of having age, of having wisdom, of having experience on your side. And what I think you can do with that is to say, okay, let me close my blinds from the outside world and, and ask myself, since I'm getting into this later in life, what can I offer that will satisfy you, the artist? And, and what I suggest you do is to look at things that you have done that is particular to you, that you know really how to do it. Think of this. Think of if someone will pay you to teach something, what is it that you are more equipped to teach at this moment? Maybe you were involved with something that had to do with engineering. Maybe you're a chef. I don't know. Whatever you were, try to look for something that you know. And I think if you start drawing that, if you start representing angles and light and shadows and stories with whatever you had experienced before, I think a lot of us will be glad to look at that art and glad to get to know your world better. So don't worry about competing in the sense that I'm late. You might be late, but you might be early in saying something that nobody has said before through art. So I believe it could be an advantage too to start later in life. Okay. <laughs> Someone loves my beard. Thank you. <laughs> my wife is the first fan, okay? So. Oh, do I think if, do I think if dreams do I think dreams offer a nice perspective, I guess, uh, for artists, no? And uh that was a question pretty much. Uh, I have, have my wife here next to me helping me with, because uh, she knows that I'm dyslexic. So when I see all the comments at once, my letters start jumping around and it's hard for me to focus in one section. But uh, talking about the dreams thing, I mean, I know we have uh, kind of no control of our dreams. And sometimes we realize that dreams do reflect our daily life, things that we have suppressed, things that we have experience an exaggerated amount of of that experience without controlling it without um, really managing it then it shows up in our dreams so i believe for artists since the artist is that person that always was weird to begin with in society because i believe the artist is capable of getting in touch with the subconscious with that level of of society that is hiding that is uh, underneath the regular mainstream exposed thing right so we have to everybody should pay attention to the dreams because it's a creation of art it's like involuntary it happens to you like i said before uh you don't happen to dreams dreams happen to us and just like art it happens to us the only thing that we can control is our tools to be able to express it and the better we express it the more we communicate it understand it ourselves and communicate it to the other people so they can engage because there are things in dreams that everybody dreams okay uh, the dreaming of falling or dreaming of a horse or a lot of dreams are particular to everyone so there is something that runs us and um and and of course we share as as um, you know as a species <laughs> and and anyway so artists yes you can pay attention to your dreams because that way you'll be balanced when something in your life is out of balance and through the art you will balance yourself you will express something that needs to be expressed think of like something boiling inside of you you don't know how to let it out it could happen in dreams so the dream is like a heads up for what's going on and maybe from there you can apply it to your life but don't be so realistic in the sense of you don't have to take it literal and say okay i'm going to have my painting resembling the dream just get the idea of the dream and follow that up with elements from life and with feelings i mean it's a task that is really difficult i mean i'm talking about stuff that is almost impossible to explain but anyways uh this is water cheers to all of you in quarantine, nice and responsible, staying home, staying away from 
your older family. Um, let me look at some cool, interesting conversations here. All of you are writing a bunch of stuff. That's uh, really good. I hope I can get to a lot of you. Vale, do you find any question that I might be missing here? Hmm. Do I think art is truly subjective? Subjective. Yes. Well, definitely. Um, the only thing that I... Hmm. That's interesting to, to say because... Obviously, art becomes an object and that object is somehow measurable. But definitely, I believe it's subjective. Um, yeah, we cannot, we cannot measure art exactly. So that's a difficult one. <laughs> Vale, you got me a hard one. <laughs> but yeah, that, well, I mean, what else can I say about that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> lost. <laughs> that changed the whole uh, turn. No. So canvases. Oil, oil primed or or um, gesso primed. Remember, the old gesso used to call, be called gesso vero. Oh, John Sanchez is up. What's up, man? What up, John? <laughs> I got some neighbors too here. I got some people from last time. Priscilla, Nis, hello. Um, I don't even know what I was talking about. Um, <laughs> oh, gesso. Okay. Um, you're asking the wrong person. I'm not so strict with the material sense. Why? Because at this point in my life, I'm finding out stuff for myself and for uh, to share with all of you, but I don't think my art is at this precious moment that needs to be extremely careful with the conservation aspect of it. There are parts that we have to kind of depend on the people that make the the these materials, these, uh, you know, these things. So let's say if we make gesso, if we buy gesso from a company, we're kind of trusting that the gesso will last. They say it will last, they say it's flexible. Then we look at the paper, it's acid free. We kind of trust it. Before they only had one source, so they had to be kind of trusted because they depended on the whole thing. But now we have so many things from outside. That's why I believe in making my own paint and making as much stuff I can, so that way I can control it better. But if you're gonna paint with oils, yes, it's better if you kind of oil prime it. But I've, I have paintings on acrylic gesso uh, prime canvas that last to this day, they're perfect. So, I mean, and they're probably like 20 years old, 15 years old, and those are my early works, but they're still in good condition uh, in, terms of, in terms of putting up with the time. But I believe, you shouldn't be concerned about that until you have a problem or until you decide that that's the most important part. I believe as artists, we should be engaging with our inside and aware of the surroundings and expressing art at a different level and not so fixated with the type of brush or the type of canvas, okay? I get a lot of questions about technical stuff like this and I think the principles and the technicality of art is important, but the materials, there is so much that we can just control and we have to let the other things take place. I have known some cases of people that, as an excuse, use the, the, the fact that they don't have the perfect tools or the perfect opportunity with the tools to give up and to delay painting and working. I don't believe that. I think you should get a brown paper bag and a pen from a restaurant steal it. <laughs> no, don't steal it. But use anything that can draw on any surface and look at things around you. Look at things that you like and work. I believe that that's uh, what cures uh, oil prime or or um, acrylic prime. But, but definitely it's an important question. I wish I knew more about this stuff. I don't have a more access to those things. All right, let's look at some questions. If you put some questions mark at the at the end, I know it's a question, so I go straight to it. How do I create depth? I believe you're talking about the depth of 
the three dimensionality of things, okay? Because uh, there's a, the, another type of depth, but that's up to you. Okay, so you have a flat surface. You want to make it look like if it's 3D, okay? The first thing you need to do is look at the 3D thing. That's why we say it's bad to work from photographs at first because that thing is flat and it's just telling you a couple of things about proportion, some color hints, but it's not like the greatest reference for, for values or for color. It's mainly just the idea, okay? So the first thing I will say is to understand the three-dimensionality of the thing you want to represent. What do I mean by that? Look at where the light source is coming from. At first, try to control it. Don't be in a place that is open with light everywhere because that's hard for the, for the shadows to stay contained, dark, and for the light to be clear. So the first thing I would say, make it easier for yourself. Get some object that you like to create this three-dimensionality. Get an object. Uh, get something, you know, easily that is three-dimensional, don't get something that is like a leaf or something that is flat, you know, but whatever. Get an object, light it up with one light source so you have a clear shadow. And then think of the object as ex staying in space. Everything goes around in perspective. Study it, look at it. And when you draw, try to do that. Try to get the light source direction. Keep everything around the light lighter because your eye will look at light things in the object and increase the contrast. That way you make it visible. We are made to see stuff in detail. And that's the worst enemy for the artist because the artist has to learn how to simplify first. So to simplify, look at the light, anything hitting the light, keep it light, all the details, keep it in context. As soon as the form starts turning and you see that it's getting into darkness, make sure you put less information there and you darken it a little bit but not as much as the shadow. As soon as you have those three things in context, the light, the middle tone, and the shadow, in relation to everything else, that should get you a nice look of three-dimensionality. If you're looking at the details as a flat thing, then it's gonna be hard. Or if you're copying a photograph, it's gonna be hard because you're copying something that is already flat to begin with, okay? Hmm, someone wants me to do more landscape painting. I know, I love landscapes so much and that's why I have planned um, the trip across the states in a studio that I can just drive around and that will push me into, you know, that will force me into landscapes that, or, you know, points of views that I might get into in painting. So definitely changing my rhythm. Is it better to paint from live or from photos? I think I just responded that. Definitely better to paint from live. I paint a lot from photos, but I do it thinking and having even more harder time trying to think of it as if it was reality. I just do it when I have no other choices. And that's why actually I'm forcing myself to go on the road. That way I force myself to work from life unexpectedly and deal with subjects that might come my way. Okay, but definitely I don't, rec I don't think that painting from, from, from photos is a good idea at the beginning when you're training. But I know that it's very useful and you don't have things around you. So you might like something that only is in a photograph. In that, in that case, try to study it, draw it, draw it many times, separate aspects of the photo and draw it by itself and get to know it better. Might as well do that because if you just do it and copy piece by piece, then you have a photographic image that yes, is good, but it has no personality. Uh, anybody could have done it and it will look like the photo. So I suggest changing it up on purpose by having your own input, your own, you know, uh, distortions added to it. You have a good question there? Hmm, what's more important, technical ability or concept? That's a, that's a good conversation to have because the, I believe the technical ability is needed in order to show a good concept. The concept is the idea. That's almost hard to get out of the system. You know, we have concepts, even if it's simple, even if it's something that you're fixated with, that's a concept. And I believe the technique is important 
for you to express the cont the the um, <laughs> The, the, the concept of it. So conceptual art is only concept. It's all about the idea. The urinal, the first one, you know, the first bold conceptual piece was to make fun of a situation. And he put a urinal upside down and colored a fountain. That's Duchamp. And that's a concept because it's all about how the thing is set up to be perceived. And I believe that doesn't last because there is a moment that the only concept that I think is valuable now is maybe people in Tesla or people in the medical field. Those are people playing with big concepts that help society or the concept of a phone. How do we make it all accessible, easy to use? Those are crazy concepts. So as artists, the ability to create a concept is not as deep if it's not accompanied, if it's not uh, expressed by a great technique because we are visual artists. And as visual artists, the, the, the concept you can write on a page and people will be impressed if it's a good concept. But a good image has to be good um, physically. Like it has to be good to the, to the viewers and to yourself as soon as you're doing it. That doesn't mean that you have to paint like someone else, okay? So there's a difference between technique. I don't want to be misinterpreted here and say, if you don't paint like the masters, it's not valuable, or you won't be able to come uh, get a good concept across if it's not painted with this meticulous technique, okay? In my case, I like to develop my technique just because we are missing it in our time. When I went to school, I didn't see it. And I'm like, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that I feel inside. I want to paint as such. I looked at the masters and nobody could help me. So I decided to sacrifice my life and my, you know, my whole being pretty much in risk the rediscovering something new, not old, something that we can use with our time. That's why I use Photoshop. I use photography. I use anything, different types of lighting, because we're not, we're not supposed to be thinking in terms of the past. We're supposed to be thinking in terms of the future. And I thought there was a missing link in terms of people abandoning too much the idea of the craft. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's the future should be. Nobody knows how to paint. I don't, I don't think so. I think uh, that's going to be always a need to play with tools and, and make people imagine things. Because the beauty, the beauty about art is that with the concept that you create, let's say some cave painting, the concept was some animals that were valued and that were hard to, to um, get or, or something like that. Okay, that was a concept. This is a simple concept, but the way it's presented, then get other people, other people's imagination to dream into this, uh, into this concept, and to and to dream into another reality. And that's how I think that we can uh, progress and make society better by offering good options. That's why I always say. Paint what's true to you. Don't do already what's beautiful. If you paint something that is already beautiful, yes, okay, of course, you're pleasing yourself, you're pleasing others if you do it the right way, but it's not really taking society to a higher level. We have to be able to learn how to see beauty in things that were not used to be taken as beautiful. So, of course, like a sunset, a flower, you know, random things that are popular. Uh, I don't believe that that will take us to a higher level, even if we paint it correctly, other than inspirational. Okay, so think about this concept versus technique and, uh, and make sure that you invent your own system to work of work that is compatible to the concept that you want to give. And that's important. So someone that paints like Bougaro, for instance, very smooth, very delicate, can be uh, appropriate to paint the youth, to paint like a young uh, girl doing a beautiful gesture or something like that. But if you're going to paint more like uh, the raft of the Medusa, like Jericho, then you need someone bolder or the black paintings by Goya. Those are required an, an intention. So you see how he's a master because he, he was able to express those themes and the potato eaters and stuff like that with those bold strokes. That's why I said that there's not universal answer for that. All right, some other questions around here. Cool. What inspires my artwork? Oh my God. I, you know, that's a very interesting question because I don't feel... 
Okay, when I go to a museum, I feel an inspiration that is different. Or when I go to a concert, or when I when I encounter good art, I feel an inspiration from that that I don't feel when I'm creating it. Okay, when I'm creating it, I'm more I'm trying to discover something. It's no time for me to be inspired. Okay, I think we should inspire other people by putting up with the work and the sacrifice to create it. Okay, but I think uh, if you think about inspiration, this is how I think about inspiration. Okay, to inspire is to inhale in a way you inspire, right? And and also there is a source of, of energy. When we give, when we eat, we take in energy. When we breathe, we take in energy. The sun gives us, you know, uh, energy. But I believe there are other things that give us energy and inspiration from other people give us energy. So there are people who just consume this inspiration from others. And that's how we balance a society. So people offer uh, this thing to, you know, this source of inspiration to society and society likes uh, that. And then that's how we stay connected. Some people get inspired, some people offer inspiration. And I find myself when I'm working, it's like a, a, a rediscovery of myself. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Questioning everything, trying to con connect with my own being at this artistic level. And I think just by doing that, once we present it, there is something almost impossible to perceive but everybody feels it and that is wow that took time he was uh looking at things differently he was going introspective he was trying to offer and and help the world so every time i see some artists doing that that's amazing that's amazing because we all can be different trees offering different fruits to society and that's how i take inspiration Yeah, is painting closer to sculpture or poetry? Painting closer to sculpture or poetry? Hmm. Never thought about that before. That's a good question because, hmm, well, you can see that a lot of paintings were inspired by sculpture and they were like kind of following sculpture, but also poetry. So the painter can get different sources to get the result he wants. But I think it's, it depends on the on the artist, on the painter. Some painter might like reading and get and get ideas from like the intellect, from philosophy, or like you know art, artistic arguments. And some some are more like secluded and ju just just want to look at nature, and that's where the ideas come. Uh, I think every artist needs to answer that for themselves, and it's fine whatever you feel. Did I go to the Bugaro exhibit? Yes, two times uh, the, as they move it. Um, so yes, I'm a big fan of Bugaro and I couldn't spend more time in the museum. Yeah, I love that guy. And it's rare too, it's rare because at the beginning I didn't like him because when I used to see the photographs and the printed images of Bugaro, it's like, this is ridiculous, what is this? Like, this is so light. Um, we're looking for more emotions, more like things. And then, then you see this girl holding a flower pot or something. And then when you see them in person, you're like, wow, technically it's incredible that someone could do that. And, uh, and that's a mystery. So that's the beauty and the truth that that is what authenticity is uh, authenticity is and at that time he was brand new he was creating these images that at that time that was a fashion to create this positive outlook inspirational um related to the past he loved um um Raphael, who was you know inspired by by the Greeks and you see all that transferring into his work but at the time that he put it out he was making a statement of like the highest standards of art and, uh, and I think if we see it like that then we see the value and we can study it but not so literal okay Yeah. Why artists do self-portraits? <laughs> That's interesting because I've done a few self-portraits myself and um, 
and I, I guess some some people asking me, oh, what do you paint yourself? And that might be some concept that maybe regular people won't understand. I believe it's a combination of things. We are curious beings, okay? Artists are curious and they want to learn about the world. And what better subject that, than to see ourselves and say, I can't believe I can try to do this with my own image and see how I can pose and express it. It's, it's almost like a meditation because when you're meditating, you're, you're with yourself in this empty, clear space. And I believe when you're painting yourself, you're kind of reflecting on that time who you are at the moment. And maybe when we see it later on, you remember feelings and aspects of that time when you painted it. That's, a, that's happened to me when I look at older uh, self-portraits. I say, look at that. Look at how I expressed myself at that time. And, and it might be a, a process. It might be a need. Even Rembrandt with all the self-portraits, you can see how he captured different aspects of his his life through portraiture. Also, a perfect model available. Actually, that's why I did my self-portrait in on my website, um, cesarsantos.com. If you want to train my technique and learn from me, I get there, I go divide the whole process. You probably know it by now. It's on my channel here, the four stages, drawing, underpainting, first painting, and second painting. And the reason I did the self-portrait was because a lot of you will be easy to learn that. Like if you sit down, set up with a mirror and practice, it's a good way to practice a process without having to deal with what I'm painting. It's just painting yourself. And if people judge it, I mean, if you're thinking of what people will think, you're already screwed to begin with as artists. Can you name your limited palette powder pigments? Um, okay, so my white, I have two because sometimes I change. You know, I'm, I'm discovering. I don't have anything set in stone. So my white in powder is titanium white, but I do have lead white already mixed because I don't want to be mixing lead here in my studio, of course. So it's titanium white. Then the yellow ochre is uh, it's called yellow ochre blue uh, ridge. And the Blue Ridge Yellow Ochre is one of the strongest yellows, yellow ochres and that's why I have it because it's a limited palette and you don't want the yellow to be that soft because then the other colors might take over. I have two types of red. I have Vermilion Powder and Canyon Red Powder. The reason I have these two is because for the flesh, I rather use Vermilion. It's a little bit more orangey. It's a little bit less intense. When you mix it, with the other colors, it doesn't impose itself as canyon red does, okay? But I do have canyon red, and in my in my instructional video on my website, that can, I did the whole thing with canyon red, and I was solving the problem. But you could see how intense those colors got at the beginning of first painting because it was harder to tone down. That's why we have the white and the black to to grade those colors. Um, and then I have ivory black as powder that I mix. I only mix it with cold press linseed oil and, um, and you know, spend the whole day kind of grinding that. And that's what I use. But again, I have other colors in tubes in case I need a note of blue, a note of brighter color, I can use it and add it to, to, my, to the colors that I, that I mix. Hmm. Someone's asking me if I ever paint without models. So creating paintings from the imagination alone. Like I said before, every artist has its syst his system. And I don't want to say something that might influence the way you create art. I believe all type of art is value and is valuable. The museum ones is a whole genre. The, the plein air painters is another genre. They're, they're art. Art, I think everybody's an artist nowadays, even with the phone, creating art and, and doing memes and stuff like this. So art is very relative and subjective. <laughs> but um, anyways, <laughs> I, I lost the track of thought there. <laughs> um, but I do believe that, that you can... I, in my case, I don't go into into just doing a piece from imagination, okay? Just to respond to that. I like 
to create an imagination first, then look for elements in reality and put them together. So either I feel I should paint someone that has this type of character and I wait and I look when I see the person that that is good for that idea, I get it and I paint it. But I don't start imagining someone and just randomly create it or a scene. That's not my type of creation. I rather have a, like I said before, a dream or, or a feeling that I want to create, reproduce and get the model for it. So that way I'm looking at how nature is involved because I believe my imagination is way less creative than nature. Nature has so much to offer that is good for my case um, to look at nature and see how it responds and paint it. Because painting is already abstract enough. Painting is already uh, conceptual enough. The idea to mix colors together to create a sense of three-dimensionality or to create a sense of story is already difficult enough. Imagine trying to create all that without reference. I believe that for me, it will be too too uh, too strange to do but i guess i have seen many people pull it off really good so i believe if you have the tendency to say i don't want to look at anything i have it all inside and put it out pff, props for you that's good that's probably pollock okay so how to avoid the nose being too long or eyes too far apart and uh, that's a that's an interesting question because that's all about proportion that's why it's important to study the head that's why I like the Russian system because they go into into the mechanics of elements isolated and they study the head by itself and then the rib cage and then the, so by the time you look at things you already know how they look and let's say the nose if you're just randomly looking with no guidance you're doing a building it's like constructing a building and doing the lobby too big or the one apartment bigger than the other apartment you cannot do that you have to have control of the structure and in painting a portrait just realize that hairline to eyebrow level is the same as eyebrow level to bottom of the nose bottom of the nose to bottom of the chin and once you know the standards of that you know that the eyes align with the edge of a edge of the mouth once you study those things you'll be able to pick them better and you don't have these exaggerated uh, errors do you have any fun question what's more important brush work or the use of color that's a that's a fun point to talk about um okay i believe brush work is more important why because you can get a grisaille, you can get just black and white, okay? And the brushwork means that your brush should, even on a flat surface, should feel as if you're painting the thing that you're painting. So let's say I'm painting the, uh, the mouse here, okay? Instead of, th so the brush strokes, when you're painting it on a flat canvas, it should feel as if you're painting on the thing. So if you're painting this, just feel it, feel it. Get the right color for the highlight, put it on top, get the right color for the shadow, put it on the back, okay? You see how silly that example was? That's how I believe you should feel when you're painting a, an, an object so that your, your hand moves around the thing. And I think that's more important than color. Now. Color adds to that. I don't want to, you know, discriminate against the colors because the colors is what's going to give this element a, a sensation of quality. What quality does that object have? It's the difference between a, a, a fruit that is ready to eat and a fruit that is just uh, green or, you know, not ready. You see, those qualities of color is what give that, that intention and more information to the viewer. So, don't think that color will solve the brush work problem. Never, never. That's why I try to not talk too much about stuff that might distract. The, the relationship should be paint, brush, brain, emotions, and canvas, and the feeling of it. And then all the other elements are there to help you uh, succeed with that. How did I approach studying anatomy? Anatomy for me was introduced in the, um, at the Angel Academy. We always had like lectures on anatomy, and at that time, I was really tough. I was really hard. I mean, it was really hard for me to understand that 
um, because I wasn't, you know, I was detached from it at first. So at first it felt like tedious and I couldn't understand it. But what I did was uh, separated into segments. So I would do, let's say, if I ever working on an area of a flesh or something, I would take the time to look at the muscles of that area and try to understand it. And little by little, as, um, so meaning I won't stop my practice just to study anatomy. I would just add a little bit of anatomy into my practice. And that way it grows together with the art. Why copying from the masters? <laughs> This is uh, interesting because even yesterday, I think someone wrote on my channel or sent me a message saying, uh, you talk about new and being you know, aware of our time, but then we're copying the masters. And it might sound like a contradiction. And, and in art, okay, art should be an imitation of your relationship with your world, okay? So you're imitating something as an artist that is relating to you okay that is important to you and um shit <laughs> stuff too let me let me the same one sorry about this i need to rethink this because i don't want to make, make it, mess it up because it's a contradiction um cop okay so let's say we are here in this time, okay? And no one alive seems to have the secrets of the masters that are filling the museums and uh, and we know that they existed and we respect that and we want to recreate it. So in a way, that's why we learn from the masters. We say, man, those people lived in times that had something that we don't have nowadays. And that's what I learned from the masters. But it's not definitely to paint like the masters. That's why even we put masters as a whole group. So you can get the general idea of what they had and not get one in particular. Yes, you can say Caravaggio or, or, or Abu Rope, for instance, they have not much in common as individuals, but their art has something in common. And those principles is, I think, that relationship between them and the tools and their world that they were living in. I don't recommend going back to that mentality now and being now and trying to paint, you know, tenebristic impressions or things that they painted, subject matter that they painted. I don't support that. That's my issue with the contemporary academies. The contemporary academies are missing out because they should be called the new realistic movement or something like that to have people forward thinking instead of backward thinking. Yes, we can learn from the masters. What did they use? What did they, but it's not to go back to them. It's always to go forward from, from that. At least that's my attitude. That's why I can keep it fresh and fun because there's no need to compete with the masters or paint like them or, or do anything like that, okay? So definitely look around and if you can, can in create a new technique, that's definitely always better. And we can create our own masters of our generation that are uh, separated and dis distinct from, from the past. Yeah, this is nice. How um, how do I keep uh, myself motivated when I feel that my painting is going bad or not going well? That's a problem with the motivation. And that's the same thing as the inspiration thing. Um, I believe, again, my opinion, I believe that you should just go to work as if you are a member of a society that needs you to do your job. Okay? We're not here alone in the world doing whatever we want, otherwise this would be a different world. And maybe actually we were going too far into that and that might be danger. I'm not saying to not be yourself and become, I mean, I escaped from Cuba, I can't stand the idea of communism and a government telling us what to do, okay? I'm not doing that. But do realize that you are part of an organism and there is a plumber that is needed for something, there's a mechanic, there's the doctor, and there are artists. And we are the fuel, we are the inspiration for those people to stay doing their work in a good manner. Everybody's connected to the arts somehow. Somehow someone has a favorite singer, somehow someone goes to concert, uh, ballet, paintings, photography, whatever. Everybody wants to be connected to the art. 
So I believe your art should be in the in the service of our society, but not on purpose. <laughs> what I mean is don't paint for the people, paint for yourself, but just the fact that you're an artist and you're at home figuring things out, that's the usefulness of, of that, okay? So when you're not motivated, think that you're part of this bigger organism that needs you to express yourself in a certain way and put it out there so we can enjoy it and think of the world in a different way. And maybe you can take people to a new psychological place that they never experienced before. And only those few people, when they keep multiplying, then you create a big audience just for the fact that you were trying to connect to yourself in the studio as an artist. So don't wait for you to be motivated. That's not like when you're motivated, you go to the beach. Okay. If you're motivated to go to the beach or you're motivated to go dance, but to paint or to do art, you, I don't think in my case, I don't feel as a motivation. It's like a constant motivation because that's my role in society. All right, guys, I'm going to take one more question and let you go. Um, I'm going to try to do this more, um, more often these days that we are kind of at home and I'm trying to do this to, to create that sense of, of, you know, kind of peace within all of us connected. <laughs> I don't have anything to say. Um, do you experiment with new mediums and does it help you as an artist? Okay. Before, when I was in conceptual, like in a contemporary art school, we used to try different things. You know, of course we tried acrylic, wash, a sculpture, a ceramics, all this stuff. And, uh, but never to a high degree because it was always experimenting in school, you know, imagine. But as soon as I developed my technique, my changes became smaller. I recommend if you're an artist that you have experience with some medium. There's some medium that calls your attention, maybe because of your environment, maybe because that's the only thing they sell in your town, maybe because you someone told you to use it. Whatever the reason is, you probably have more experience in one thing than other. Okay, I want to warn you, I want to make you aware that a lot of the things that are alien to us as artists look sometimes more interesting and more attractive than the things that we already have. And, and I see that happening. Normally, a lot of people are less happy with what they have and they think, if I only could do that with that other medium. I don't recommend that, okay? So what I believe you should do is change with, unless, if you don't have anything yet that you love, okay, test everything. But once you love something, stay loyal to it and make the changes within it. That way you become more specific and more of an expert at one thing than if you jumped from sculpture to animation and then digital painting and then painting in oil and then acrylics, okay? That would distract you. Yes, your artistic energy is feeding itself because it's going and expressing itself around doing other stuff. But I believe to be able to con complete a connection with a medium, you have to understand it. So go narrow, go into, into it, and make the changes subtle within the thing. Yes, I believe in always changing. Like my process is always changing. If I do the next video, I will do it differently with different colors. And that's the, that's the beauty of it. But I mean, I can just change some colors in my palette. Maybe the process is different. Instead of drawing first, I go put color first and then draw on top. You see, like there is so many things that you can vary and change within a small uh, spectrum than, than trying different things and looking for things. Because the moment you don't, you don't get in touch and really grasp all these mediums, what happens is that you're gonna keep, keep changing in time and never ending, uh, you know, kind of uh, rhythm. So, okay guys, I'm gonna have a lot of the sip. Mm -hmm. Stay safe, please be aware of what's going on. But don't get too involved with the craziness. Think that it's better to be calm and it's better to focus into um, what you're being called to do, which is create art, I hope. If not, do what you do. Cheers. Bye.